Hello again, everybody, and welcome into our video series here on BaltimoreBaseball.com. I'm Steve Cocky, and as always, now we're going to bring in our senior writer, Dan Connolly, to talk some baseball with us from the Hall of Fame to the Oriole offseason to Fan Fest coming up here on Saturday. Hey, Dan, how are you? Good, Steve. How you doing? Not too bad. I would be doing a little better if the Orioles were a little more active, but we'll we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but Dan, I want to start with Hall of Fame voting. So uh, on Wednesday, you are, of course, a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America, and your, yourself and your colleagues voted four new members into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Two former Orioles, Vlad Guerrero and Jim Tomei, as well as Trevor Hoffman, and of course, Chipper Jones, uh, a first ballot guy there. Dan, your thoughts on this ballot? I know you wrote on our site, BaltimoreBaseball.com, earlier this week that you had a bit of trouble uh, sticking to that that limit of 10 guys. Yeah, Steve, it's tough. I mean, the, the limit is 10, and we have a really full ballot. I mean, it's just, you know, because of the whole steroid situation, the performance-enhancing drugs, you know, we have several guys who should already be in the Hall of Fame who are not because of that. And, and you know, many voters don't want to vote for them. So what it's caused is a glut. And, you know, it's we saw it the last couple of years. Now, finally, I think the last three or four years, there's been multiple guys voted in. And this year, four, which is the most since, I think, 2015. So, you know, we're, we're starting to get to the point where some of these guys are coming off of the board. And that's good because I had I felt really confident with that I wanted to off and probably as many as 15 or 16 that I can make a real case for. Dan, talk a little bit about um, Edgar Martinez. Two guys I'll, I'll, I'll hit you with. Edgar Martinez, who just missed by a, a small handful of votes, and then Omar Vizquel, who was someone that you put on your ballot and felt pretty strongly about, uh, but maybe wasn't a, a real darling of, of certain communities within baseball writers, certainly the, the sabermetric type folks. Yeah, well, let's start with Edgar Martinez. You know, he gets hit as far as votes are concerned because they from his career. And frankly, doesn't he hitting, that's a, that's a skill, it's a job, and doesn't he hitter is a position in the American League. It has been since 1973. So he played a position. Now, whether that position's in the field or not, okay, you can argue, well, maybe he should have played in the field more. But this is one of the best hitters of our generation, one of the most feared hitters of our generation. You know, he didn't make the majors really fully until he was 26, 27 years old, too, because the Mariners had a third baseman and Jim Presley, the former Orioles hitting instructor, who had been an all-star. So they finally gave an opening to Edgar Martinez, even after he was crushing the ball in AAA, and he crushed the ball in the majors for years upon years. Now, yes, he moved from third base to, to DH. But he was the best in baseball at the position. There is an award for designated hitters named after the guy. So I don't see how you can can stop him from getting into the Hall of Fame. I have voted for Edgar Martinez every year I've been able to. And every year he's been eligible and I've been able. I think there's like 30 some uh, voters that have to vote for him for him to get in. Hopefully that'll be the case. As for Omar Vizquel, I, I think he was the best defensive player for a generation. And that, to me, means a lot, especially in this PED era that we're voting on where, you know, home runs kind of took the whole thing and and no one really paid attention to the other things. And while Barry Bonds was in San Francisco, you know, hitting a thousand home runs or or 700 anyway, you know, Vizquel was his teammate in San Francisco and also played in Cleveland and other places and was, you know, the best defensive shortstop. I talked and I wrote about it in BaltimoreBaseball.com. I talked to Mike Bordick about it, who was his counterpart, Vizquel's counterpart in the American League for so many years. And he said, are you kidding me? Of course, is a Hall of Famer. He was the best at the toughest position. And he was a tough out. He had 2,800 and some hits. He, you know, he stole bases. The problem with the, you know, the sabermetricians are not big fans of Vizquel. And one of the main reasons is because defensively, he is not considered – so much better than every other boy. And, you know, based when you looked at, at the defensive metrics, the scale is kind of an, a good shortstop. He's not considered a great shortstop or the best elite shortstop via the statistics. But I hate defensive metrics. We've talked about this. I don't think there's any true qualifier that kind of tells us how good a defensive player is. You know, when it comes to offensive players, even pitchers, 
I'm all for advanced metrics, but I I am not a big fan of defensive metrics, especially when they tell me that Omar Vizquel was just pretty good. So I think that's where the you know, the chasm comes in, you know, for voters. But for me, Vizquel's a Hall of Famer. He'll remain on my ballot. And the interesting thing is, he actually got more than I thought he would, Steve. He got 30-some percent, which is not a bad showing for a first-year guy. In fact, I'm sure we want to talk about him, but when Mike Messina first came on the ballot, he only had 20%. Yeah, let's touch on Mucina here real quickly, Dan, before we move on to some Oriole-related uh, off-season news. But yeah, Mucina, as you as you mentioned, he started in that 20-some percent range when he first got onto the ballot. He's, he's really advanced here, and some are saying it's kind of an if-not-when scenario for Mike Mucina. Do you think within the next year or two uh, he is a Hall of Famer? I think it is definitely an it's-not-when. I mean, if-not-when. He is going to be a Hall of Famer within the next two years. I'm pretty confident of that, the way his numbers have grown each year, and especially because, you know, several players are off the ballot now, and so it should make it easier for Mike Messina to be included. So I think it's possible he goes he has 63.5% of the vote this year. I think it's possible he gets 70% next year. Yeah, Mariano Rivera is coming in, and he's the only, like, slam dunk to come in for next year. Uh, you know, Roy Halladay will, will be uh, included. Uh, Todd Helton will be on the, the first year group. But I think Messina has a really good chance next year. Then I would be absolutely shocked if he's not in in 2020. And so I think that Mike Messina is going to be a, you know, a Hall of Famer in either 2019 and 2020. And that means he's going to go in with a Yankee teammate, either Mariano Rivera in 19 or that Jeter fella in 2020. Good stuff, Dan, on Hall of Fame. Now let's shift a little bit to the Orioles and this incredibly slow offseason. It's the slowest offseason I can remember. I heard you say the other day that it's one of the strangest, if not the strangest, that you feel like you've ever covered as a baseball journalist. What's going on here? What are your theories on on why things are so slow? And do you see things picking up here for the Orioles or, or anyone else uh, over maybe the next week or so? Well, they have to pick up at some point because teams need to field 25 guys to play baseball. So at some point, Steve, there will be signings of free agent players because there's a whole lot of good free agent players out there. I don't know when. I mean, you know, FanFest is coming up, as we're going to talk about on Saturday. And usually the Orioles have a couple additions to, you know, parade out there on FanFest. Right now, unless they do something on Friday, you know, they're not going to have that. And, and, they're not alone. And I think there's several reasons. Now, you know, a lot of people have thrown out the, the big C word of collusion and that owners are, or and GMs and such are colluding to make sure that, you know, these big salaries aren't being paid these free agents. I'm not quite sure that's the case, but I will tell you a couple things. Agents in the last couple of weeks, they're amazed how few uh, actual offers that they've gotten. Even the big guys aren't getting many offers. By this time, by mid to late January, most guys are signed and teams are still kicking the tires on these players, which is crazy to me. But even the best players don't have major league offers or more than one or two major league offers to choose from. And I, I think the reason is because it's been so slow and stalled, the, the GMs are kind of waiting to see how much falls to them. And I think it's, it's kind of a smart thing. Is that collusion? I don't necessarily think so, but it certainly is an interesting situation that you know, the top guys aren't even getting many offers. And I think what really has happened is over the years, the way baseball has changed, it's become pretty obvious that a good way to build your team is not through free agency. So I really, I mean, I'm intrigued. And I, I'm, if I was a free agent baseball player right now, I wouldn't be intrigued. I'd be livid. But right now as a baseball writer, I'm intrigued. I want to see where this goes. And I want to see what some of these numbers end up being for some of these players. We'll touch on this real quick, Dan. Uh, protective netting at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. It was expanded um, pretty significantly. It'll start around, I believe, Section 14 on the first base side um, when it had been just kind of confined to those couple of sections behind home plate. Your thoughts on on this? Will it impact fans at all? Um, and did the Orioles make the right move here? I, I think it's yeah. I think it's like 16 to 58 or something like that is the the sections, which is basically dirt to dirt around the diamond, and Will it affect fans? Yeah, the, the view's not going to be as good. However, and I, I made this joke earlier, you know, the view's not going to be as good, but the view's even worse if you catch a baseball in your eye. 
So this is a, you know, this is something that had to happen. It's happened throughout Major League Baseball stadiums. The Orioles are maybe extending it a little further than some. Um, you know, I'm at the ballpark 60, 70, 80 times a year uh, in Camden Yards alone. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody get, as we call it, smoked with a ball or even a bat. Um, and it's a scary, scary situation. So you can blame the fans whether they're not paying attention or whatever. But that, even if you're paying attention, those balls come screaming 90, 100 miles an hour, 115 miles an hour, whatever, off the bat. Um, it's hard to get out of those. I mean, I know in the press box it's hard to get out, and we have a little bit more reaction time. So I, I think it's kind of a – it makes sense. And I, I know some fans, you know, aren't excited about the view itself. But I think in the long run, it makes a lot of sense. Finally, Dan, before we let you go, we've got to get to shameless plug time here on our video. You mentioned uh, Orioles Fan Fest a couple of minutes ago. And we have to mention that we will be there, uh, yourself and and myself as well, um, on Saturday at the Baltimore Convention Center. Uh, we'll have a booth there as we did last year. We were really excited last year to, to see all of our loyal readers and fans and to chat about the Orioles. And we hope you will show up again this year. Uh, be sure to get there early and often because we will be giving away to the first 150 fans that either have our app already or download it uh, there in front of us. Uh, free BaltimoreBaseball.com t-shirts. Preview here. Spoiler alert. So be sure to stop by pick up a t-shirt. We'll be happy to see you. And Dan, I believe you will have copies of your book for sale as well. Is that correct? It is correct. And we're pretty excited about it. My book, uh, 100 Things Orioles Fans Need to Know or Do Before They Die. And uh, one of the things you have to do in 101 is stop by our booth and meet us before you die, Orioles fans. It should be a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun last year. I'm going to try to make myself a little bit more available this year as well. Uh, instead of running back and forth with the uh, interviews. So hopefully we'll get a chance to, to – Steve and I will get a chance to meet you guys, and that will be fantastic. You know, we, we almost feel like we have a relationship with a lot of people, especially in uh, Connolly's Corner Sports Bar. So – or, or Connolly's I, – I screwed that up. I should go back for Connolly's Tap Room. Oof. Um, going back to the old days. But anyway, uh, so, so please stop by and get a chance to meet us. You said it, Dan. Stop by Orioles Fan Fest Baltimore Convention. Center on Saturday. Dan Connolly will be there. I will be there. And until next time for our video series, so long.